We spent a good bit of time talking about the transmission loss that is associated with the wavefront as it travels down to some reflector, let's say reflector N here, and then back to the surface. Uh, on its way down, the, as it passes through each interface, the amplitude of the wavefront is scaled by the transmission coefficient. So as we go down, we have TD1 through the first layer, TD2 times TD2, the transmission coefficient for the second layer, and so on. All the way down to the reflector surface, and then back to the surface again. So in this next expression here, we've just paired the down and up terms together. So we have TD1 times TU1, TD2 times TU2, and so on. And this represents the two-way transmission loss, as we discussed, uh, associated with the reflection from this nth interface. And remember, the interpreter would ideally like in their seismic section to see reflection events uh, proportional to the reflection coefficient. So these paired terms of transmission coefficients are basically equal to, we noted by definition that TD1 is equal to 1 plus R1. Uh, since the sign of the reflection coefficient changes uh, when we come back up, um, R1 is the negative of R1 going down. We have this product, 1 plus R1 times 1 minus R1, it's just equal to 1 minus R1 squared. And so that this series of um, two-way transmission losses becomes a series of factors, uh, 1 minus R1 squared times 1 minus R2 squared, and so on. This set of factors here represents the two-way transmission loss, and we've represented it in a simplified notation using the pi notation here. We have, uh, we're just taking the product of 1 minus R sub I squared as I goes from 1 to and minus 1. And so this uh, series of factors is scaling the amplitude from this nth reflection. Now remember that the we're talking about energy. This is, um, this is an energy loss here. Uh, these two-way transmission terms uh, represent energy. And so in this um, plot that we presented the last time. This is an energy loss. This two-way transmission loss is an energy loss, not amplitude. And we'll discuss the equivalent amplitude loss in the uh, next presentation, but just keep that in mind. And um, we noted that the processor, you want to see a seismic section in which the amplitudes are proportional to the reflection coefficient. So you want to remove effects associated with transmission and other effects. But that can be a complicated task because the two-way transmission losses are dependent upon the geology as we noted in this particular data set here that we have some large coefficient reflection coefficients here and also in here which produce kind of a nonlinear drop or a break from what might be a, kind of a almost almost linear drop but we have these breaks in there and uh, associated with this two-way transmission, these series of factors as we go through each layer. And you could take a rather rigorous approach and use well logs to try to do this in detail. But of course, once you get away from your well, um, the characteristics of the subsurface are going to change. And, and uh, you might also decide to, decide to do it in a more general way using some polynomial, exponential, or other way of fitting the transmission loss. But the idea is that uh, the processor is going to be tasked with having to remove these, um, these losses and their influence on the reflection coefficient. Now at this point, is, this is probably a good point to remind you of the convolutional model. We have a seismic signal which is equal to the convolution of the wavelet times the reflection coefficient series. And so we have a simplified reflection coefficient series here. 
And all this formula says is that the signal should consist of ref reflected wavelets that are scaled and proportional to the ref reflection coefficients. They'll have the same duration, the same, same length and time, but their amplitude will be increased or decreased uh, depending on the reflection coefficient. So, as we can see here, these wavelets are scaled. Uh, the amplitude here of the reflection greater than this one because the reflection coefficient is greater and so on. And the seismic signal that we get, we hope, is has amplitudes that are proportional to the reflection coefficients. Now, here is a problem that we will have to talk about uh, later, and that is this idea of constructive interference where we can see that the second cycle on the reflection from this uh, first reflection coefficient, this follow cycle here, or second cycle, comes in and is superimposed on top of the reflection from this negative reflection coefficient lying below it. And the net effect is to produce a fairly large amplitude <coughs> apparent reflector there. And the only reason the amplitude is, is large is, is, is a bit misleading because it's not due to a larger reflection coefficient, but rather due to a superposition of the reflections from these two, um, two boundaries. So that's, that's something that we'll have to talk about uh, at some point in the future. So you as an interpreter, if you are an interpreter, if you're a processor, you know what your task is. Your task is to remove these kinds of influences. The transmission losses are going to diminish the amplitudes of these reflectors as we go from the near surface down into the subsurface. And we'll show in, in fairly uh, in considerable graphical detail, we'll show uh, how significant these amplitude losses are. But now we're going to shift over to another amplitude uh, reduction mechanism, and that's referred to as spherical divergence. This is a bit of a simplification because we're assuming that the wavefront is a sphere. But the idea is that the, um, the energy in this wavefront is distributed over this um, expanding surface, the expanding surface area of the wavefront, as it uh, propagates down to a reflector and then back to the surface. So we have a certain amount of energy that's created by the source. It gets distributed over the area of the wavefront. And um, this relationship here we're looking at is energy per unit area. And uh, so we can see that energy per unit area is inversely proportional to the square of the radius. Because we're dealing with a hemisphere, the area of the hemisphere is 2 pi r squared. So the energy per unit area is proportional, inversely proportional to the uh, square of the radius. Now, in the case of the elastic disturbance that we've been talking about, we have uh, the potential energy is just the negative of the integral from 0 to x of f dx, and this is equal to, um, uh, you know, this definite integral here. We have kx uh, uh, just from Hooke's law, kx dx. The minus signs cancel out here, and this integral is just 1 half kx squared. And we could do the, we could, we could also do this for the kinetic energy, uh, just have a, taking the definite integral from 0 to, to v of mv dx dt, or mv dv. And likewise, we get uh, kinetic energy equal to 1 half mv squared. So what we can see is that energy is proportional to displacement squared. It's also proportional to, we can think of this as the particle velocity, the velocity of an individual particle. And it's displacement from uh, equilibrium. So, the energy of the spring at maximum displacement is all potential, and it's equal to 1 half kx squared. So we've seen that energy is proportional to amplitude squared, and amplitude therefore is proportional to the square root of the energy, or to the square root of E over R. So, uh, just taking the uh, R out of this uh, square root. And we also showed earlier that the pressure 
was equal to plus or minus the impedance, the product of uh, density and wave propagation velocity times the particle velocity, so ZV or rho VV, and that the rate of energy transfer, remember when we want to do characterize this in terms of energy, we saw that the energy was equal to the product of the pressure times the particle velocity, and uh, that would then be equal to the impedance times the particle velocity squared. So V then, uh, we can look at the particle velocity, and we know that it's also going to be proportional to the pressure divided by the impedance. So we have plus or minus, plus or minus P over rho V. So that V squared is proportional to P squared. And the energy then is proportional to the amplitude squared, where we're considering, not to confuse this with area, but, but just the amplitude. And we're considering amplitude as being a measure either of the pressure, so being proportional to pressure squared, or to velocity squared so that we have amplitude proportional to the square root of the energy over the distance traveled, proportional to the pressure uh, disturbance on the wavefront uh, divided by the distance traveled, or the particle velocity divided by the distance traveled. So, so we have this relationship of the amplitude of the propagating wavefront at some actually two-way travel time, but or one-way travel time. Uh, we have a sub r proportional to the square root of e over r, p over r, or v over r. Now, p and v are parameters that we can measure with a geophone. So if we have the reflection coming back to the surface to a geophone, uh, the geophone could be recording pressure variations, as in the case of a hydrophone, or particle velocity variations, as in the case of a uh, uh, land-based uh, land um, uh, geophone. So in general, the spherical divergence is noted as um, equal to the source amplitude divided by the distance traveled. Now just as a footnote, uh, we have the... We, you sometimes encounter trapped waves. These can be this could be in a low velocity interval like a cool scene, for example, where you have high velocity intervals above and below the coal. And uh, so the wavefront then is a cylindrical wave. And the area of the wavefront is 2 pi r, the circumference, times the thickness of the layer. So we have 2 pi r delta z. And just using a similar line of reasoning as we did with the expanding spherical, hemispherical wavefront, we have that the energy is proportional to the energy of the source divided by 2 pi r delta z. Or we can say that the amplitude then is proportional to uh, e sub s over r. And using our previous relationships that we established, then we could, you know, the square root of... Uh, e sub s over the square root of r. The square root of e sub s would be equal to p or v, so that we have the amplitude being proportional to the pressure over the square root of um, distance traveled, or the particle velocity over the square root of distance traveled. So the amplitude then for these trapped waves uh, varies as the um, uh, inversely as the square root of the distance traveled. So the next time we're going to consider the influence of attenuation, we've talked about uh, two-way transmission losses, we've talked about spherical divergence losses, uh, we're going to talk about attenuation the next time, and um, we've correct, corrected for spherical divergence, so we're probably on a little bit more solid ground for considering the wavefront to be a plane wave. And we can look at that plane wave as it goes as it propagates over a distance dr, as having a decrease in amplitude, dA, which is proportional to the source amplitude times this differential step. In other words, we're losing amplitude, so we have a negative sign here. 
and this change in amplitude then would be proportional to the sor negative of the source amplitude times the uh, step length. So as a challenge for you, integrate the above relationship to determine absorption as a function of distance traveled. And uh, next time we'll consider attenuation losses, losses or absorption in more detail and introduce the uh, decibel scale. This is a logarithmic scale uh, as a measure of the uh, amplitude, seismic amplitude, amplitude decay, and uh, uh, so on. So uh, thanks for joining us and uh, hope you'll join us uh, next time.